This is my redstone computer in Minecraft that I finished building two days ago, but am just now making a video on it, because I'm bad at making videos and I've done a lot of takes already, so let's hope there isn't another one. Anyways, I'm just standing up here to let you like see the whole thing, so I'm actually going to start talking about it from the control panel here. So, first of all, this display just shows a single 8-bit number in decimal. I can also turn the display on and off through this lever, which isn't very useful of a feature, to be honest, but I just felt like including it because it was very easy to do. So, yeah. Anyways, on the other side of the control panel, I can turn the clock on or off. So the clock here is a 22-tick clock, that, which means, what that means is that tw every 22 ticks, or every 2.2 seconds, not 1.2 seconds, it sends a pulse here that basically runs the instruction. So, I can also press this button to do a manual tick, that is, instead of the clock sending those pulses, you can send those pulses manually, which is useful for software debugging, for, that is to say, debugging your new programs you're writing for it. So then that signal, whether it be from the clock or from the manual tick, gets sent to the program counter to update it. And updating it can either mean incrementing the address, which is done through this part of an adder. It's not really even a half adder. Actually, I guess it is. Anyways, so that is part of an adder that all it can do is it can increment. It can't actually add. So that can increment to go to the next instruction, the next line in this ROM. Alternatively, it can also have the address be just completely overridden if you need to do a jump or a branch, for example. So the address from the program counter goes into these decoders, which selects a line of this ROM to read from. So if I block the signal from the ROM, to, so I can safely demonstrate, as you can see, I have on these torches, and when a line is selected, it is turned off and that means that those torches go on, so those bits are activated. So this is a pretty typical ROM design, especially for programs being stored. There are a bunch of other ROM designs, and you'll see a different kind used for a different purpose later on. Anyways, so the program ROM has two main sections. This 4-bit blue section, which is for the opcode, and this this 8-bit green section, which is split into different shades of green for the nibbles, which is just a, which is just a visual aid for programming. Like, it would be a pain in the ass to try to count out 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 bits, so instead I just have it split along the middle for easier bit, for, just to make it easier to know which bit to add a torch on, or which bit to take a torch off of. Anyways, so this opcode goes into these decoders here, which basically activate one of these torches and send a signal to the component that needs the signal. So for example, if the opcode says read from RAM, then the signal is sent to the RAM, for example. Anyways, so this 8-bit section has a few purposes. It can be used as a RAM address, or it can be used as a CPU value, if you want to store a value to the CPU instead of storing a RAM address to the CPU. It can also be used to specify a ROM address, a program address, to branch or jump to, if you want, if that presents itself. Which you'll really only need to do at the end of loops and such. Anyways, so now I'm going to talk about the RAM here. So these are the decoders that select one of these RAM locations, one of these 8-bit RAM locations. There are 8 bits, and there are 15 total RAM locations, so there are 15 bytes of RAM. This right here is the writing system. So this, so the bit to write, the byte to write, comes in through these lines, gets inverted, and that means that we can store the inverse of the CPU output into any one of these 15 at RAM addresses. And the reason we store the inverse is because of how the read system works. So if I have this on, then this piston is extended, which keeps this line off. If I have this off, then this piston is... Oh wait, sorry. 
that only happens if this line turns on. Anyways, so if this is off, then when it's read by sending a signal through here to turn that torch off, then this will be on. So the read system basically inverts the, the stored value, and that's why I invert values before storing, because inverting twice is the same as not inverting at all. It puts out the normal non-inverted version. And as I explained earlier, this bus, which is the CPU input, can not only have RAM values stored to it, it can also have values from the ROM stored to it, from that 8-bit green section. And that comes in through here. You can see these torches coming up into these lines. And that leads me to the CPU. Now, the CPU input comes into one of these two registers, which can have values saved to them by activating these lines here. So these are the two input registers, the A register and the B register. I just call them that to make explaining functions a little bit easier. Well, describing, not really explaining. I haven't explained functions to anyone so far. So for instance, I could just say things like A plus B, A minus B, or A and B, for example. If I just say the function is subtraction, it might not be clear which is subtracting from which. And the order obviously matters in subtraction, for example. Anyway, so this ALU is based on an instant carry adder design that some of you might have seen before. It's just the first instant carry adder that I learned, and so far the only one I've learned. So the CPU output here can go in a few directions. First of all, it can go back into the CPU itself, as you can see here. So it just goes around like that and then comes back into the inputs. It can also be sent out to the RAM here, in this direction. And it can also be sent to this register for the display. So this stores the value that's displayed. And also the output is also processed through these two lines. So this is the zero flag, and this is the overflow flag, or the carry out flag. So this line turns on if the CPU's output is zero, which it currently is. As, as you can see, this line is active. This line becomes active if there's a carry out, that is to say, if it's trying to carry to, the bit, to a bit that doesn't exist, a hypothetical ninth bit. And that is also a signifier of an integer overflow. So that can be called either the carry out flag or the overflow flag. I personally prefer to call it the overflow flag. And the conditional branching is handled here. So these four lines are from the decoders for the branch instructions. And as you can see here, if I turn this off, then this line isn't blocked, but this line is. Redstone signals can pass through slime blocks. And if I turn this on, it's exactly the opposite. This line is blocked, but this line isn't. And the same happens here as well. So this is so these pistons receive signals from the zero and overflow flags. And so that's how the conditional branching works. Unconditional jumps come from this line and just completely bypass that system. And then this line is sent to the program counter to tell it to, so, to save the address specified by the ROM rather than incrementing the current address. And, another, and now for the display itself. So the display value is stored in here, where it passes through this thing that converts it to binary coded decimal, which is basically just decimal digits, but are stored in binary. For instance, this is the ones unit stored in binary, this is the tens unit stored in binary, and this is the hundreds unit stored in binary. And then it goes through these decoders, which, which select a certain one of these vertical ROM addresses. Not really addresses, these vertical ROM slots to specify how this, which pistons, so which of these lines of pistons should be extended and which should be retracted. And that's how it displays the numbers. Anyways, I think that's enough testing for now. Let's demonstrate it. The program I currently have stored is the Fibonacci sequence. Anyways, as I said, the clock is 22 ticks, so that means that every 22 ticks, or 2.2 seconds, an instruction is executed, and the loop in this program consists of 7 instructions, and 22 times 7 is 15.4 seconds per loop, so this thing is fairly slow. Anyways, in a moment, we should start seeing the number 1 pop up. 
Wait, did I forget something? Hang on a minute. Yes, I did. I left these blocked during my demonstration of the program ROM. Apologies for that. <laughs> Alright, take two. Alright, apologies for that. Turns out I forgot to initialize it, or at least I think that's what happened. I forgot to initialize it after running it last time. So this is the initialize button. I wasn't planning on revealing this feature until after I demonstrated the program. But basically what this does is it resets the computer. It sets the program counter to zero, it clears the RAM, it clears the CPU registers, it clears the display register, and it sets the CPU function to addition, which is what I've chosen to be the default. Anyways, let's run it. I know it works now. Unless it magically changed without me changing anything. Alright, it is working. Just as I thought it would. I actually did get it working before behind the scenes, but I cut that out. Or at least I'm going to cut that out. Note to my future editing self. So, yeah. It is running now, as you can see. It's going to take, I don't know, I think one or two minutes to run completely, so if you don't feel like watching it count on top, changing a number every 15 seconds, then feel free to skip ahead. Alright, we're coming up to the end. The next number is going to be 233, which is the highest Fibonacci number that is able to be stored in 8 bits. I included a conditional check in the program to make sure it doesn't integer overflow, so this is the last number it's going to show. It's stopping here. And if I... whoops, I did not mean to open the inventory. If I come here, you can see the block getting pushed down, as I mentioned earlier, to jam the clock. So, based, so, as I said, what this does is it prevents the clock from ticking any further. And the block gets pulled back up when we initialize, which I will do now. As you can see, it's all initialized now. This block is pulled back up. Program counts as zero. RAM is clear, which you can see here. And the CPU is outputting and, in and receiving zero as input. So that's it. Thanks for watching. I'm going to make a programming tutorial for this computer in the future, but for now that's it.